show. Hey there, folks. This is the Eric Metaxas Show. I don't know about you, but when I hear Karen Carpenter, I think of Peter Hitchens. Peter Hitchens, welcome to the program. I never heard anyone say that before. Nor shall you again hear it, nope. sir. Peter, where are you coming from? We're in different time zones. Uh, even in, when you're with me, even when I'm in the same room with you, I feel that we're in different time zones. Where uh, you, you are, of course, in 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 England. I am uh, in New York. Uh, where uh, from? Where are you coming? You've just arrived home. The, the ancient city of Oxford. Uh, nah, never heard of it. Not ringing any bells. So you, sorry, you, sorry. your your home is is Oxford, but That's you've come right. from. You've come up from London, have you not? I have come up from London, yes. And what, what were you doing in London, sir? Working. Now, why do you have to go to London to work? You work in a factory? That's what do you do? It's the capital city. I'm a national newspaper journalist. If I don't work in the capital, I lose touch with events very quickly. Uh, it's, uh, capitals have a special atmosphere, and you can pick up gossip and rumor and feelings about things there, which you can't if you don't. What do you do? What do you do? Skulk skulk around, skulk, skulk around hotel lobbies. I skulk around. You skulk even when you're sleeping. I know you because I've met you. But what? what, uh, It's interesting because you are you're a newspaper man. You write a column. Now your your regular column is uh, for which paper? The Mail on Sunday. The Mail on Sunday. It is very difficult to explain to an American audience. British newspapers have Sunday newspapers and daily newspapers. Sunday newspapers are not at least not always, simply the Sunday editions of the day, Daily. They are separate newspapers. They are weekly newspapers that come That's out on right. Sundays. Yeah, they're much more, as a result, they're much more like news magazines than they are like newspapers, and they'd like to set the agenda, that is to say the stories that they publish on Sunday tend to be the ones that dominate the, the news diaries of the following week. Oh. So the, the, the week turns, and it's, it's Sunday when the big news stories break. It's an old, it's an old English tradition. Okay. Uh, and and so, uh, what what do you write? You write a column. I write a column of comment on uh, on, on issues of the week, which I choose. Which you Sometimes choose. I, and usually, it's uh, between three and five items, and some, sometimes, very occasionally, it'll just be one item. But I try, I try to vary it. And we can find this online if... if, uh, if you can find it online. The best way to find it is at Peter Hitchens' blog, where I post my column every Sunday. And also you can find the other things that I write between uh, weekends, which are uh, on other subjects, which are uh, for which you might say there's no room in the newspaper. Now, you write... Uh, okay, so you write that once a week, but you also write other columns. I write. Well, they're not columns because they don't appear in the newspaper. They're just they're just blogs. So they're okay. particular articles. I might write uh, between three and five of those during a week. And how long the the one that you write for the, for the Sunday uh, paper? How long is that? It's about eleven or twelve hundred words, depending on headlines and pictures. Okay. So then the question, of course, is why would one have to travel all the way from Oxford? To London, just just to write a column, you could write it at home. You could, but it would it would miss it would miss an awful lot of necessary things. I would just be a person sitting in a in a, in a provincial city, trying to work out what was going on from far away, <laughs> and it's just not the same. I, you don't really have a London in the United States. You know what? You, you have we... New York City, and you have Washington D.C., and you have Los Angeles, and you have Chicago, and elements of each of them concentrate in London. There is only one really important city in the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland, and that is London. All the other cities are nowhere near like it in size or importance, in commercial significance, in political significance, or in cultural significance. If you aren't there, you don't really know what's going on. I have never thought of that, but that is quite right. That's, I mean, it's a uh, it's very different, but similar in Greece. I mean, there's Athens, and then there's the rest yeah, of the country. But, there's but, nothing but, else. But again, Greece is a much smaller country than the United Kingdom, both in terms of population and in terms of the economy and in terms of, uh, well, I, what can I say? It's it's just a smaller country. This is this is the, the former capital of, of one of the world's great empires, and it still has pretensions uh, which, uh, which have carried on down from the days when when we were still an important imperial world city, we're probably more more in touch with the rest of the planet than most uh, the most capital cities. I would think probably of the European capitals, only Paris and Moscow would consider themselves to have as as much interest in the outside world. 
Well, even when I'm agreeing, former imperial capitals. Even when I'm agreeing with you, you disagree with me. It's very difficult. I was simply making the point. With you. I, I was simply, on the idea. but no, right. But I was simply making the point that when one is in Greece, one notices that there is not there's Athens, and then there's everything else. There is yep. nothing in the United States. There are many cities, uh, as you said earlier, that you know you could say that city. Chicago's an important city. Los Angeles is an important city. There are many different kinds of important cities, yeah, but, but you're... And, and not not all of them is the capital either. Germany has a similar position. There are many many important cities in Germany: Frankfurt, Hamburg, uh, Cologne, Munich, uh, are all extremely important. Al- although uh, you Berlin, could Berlin, the capital, is is isn't doesn't dominate Germany the way London. Does. Well, but but still. Berlin was once the capital of an empire. It was, but it's uh, but it, it, it's still not really acknowledged by many Germans as being particularly German. And right, they, it's way far out to the east. Uh, I'm, I'm when settled- Konrad Adenauer was was chancellor of the, the, what was then West Germany, whenever his train crossed over uh, the the River Elbe heading east, he would he would roll over in his sleeping car and say, "Ach, Asia." Uh, as far as you said, Berlin was beyond the, was beyond the Urals. It, it, it's not. It doesn't have that. Uh, beyond the have, Urals, no, you make it sound really, bit. really. Uh, it's really the real. German. The other big German cities do not regard it as being superior to them. Uh, all right then. Um, it, it, it's interesting. So London, the, the, London is a very special place. Uh, I, listen, I think so much of London that my wife and I we had our honeymoon in London. We didn't yeah. go there for the beaches. So no, you uh, wouldn't have done that. We or think if you had you would have been disappointed. We, we, yes, well, but but there it is are beaches. It, we now have uh, beaches in in London in the summer. They put sand down by the river, but I have to say it would it would uh, it would take a lot of persuasion to get me to dip so much that, as a toe into the <laughs> <laughs> that's that's just horrible. Well, anyway, but okay. So so you do go to London. How many times a week do you go there? Uh, five or six times. Wow, you're on the train an awful lot. That's right. Yeah, I like trains. That seems great, to me great places for, for reading and thinking. Do you write on the train? Not often. No, generally it's reading. But that's extraordinary. So you value your alone time in the car. Do you, are you ever bothered by people? Not much. Not much. No. Can you give us any specific instances of when you were bothered by someone? I can only think of one, and that was a, a, a drunk person who wanted to pick a quarrel with me, uh, but I got rid of him. Did, did he know that you were the writer Peter Hitchens? He did, yes. He, oh, he didn't, even though he, he was drunk? It, well, especially because he was drunk, I think he didn't, but he didn't appreciate my writing as much as I, I might have hoped he would. <laughs> and if he was sober, he might have appreciated it well, less. Well, there's always that, too. But I, th- th- he was definitely not sober. Okay. Well, we're... we're, we're um, this we're, happens very rarely. I don't want you to have the idea that, that the, the trains... You know, the drunks are constantly attacking you on the train? Man, it's all right. Not, at most times of day, it's not like that at all. Okay. Uh, you, don't you, travel too late in the evening. You, uh, okay. But so, you, gosh, you are on the train quite often traveling to London. People thinking, Eric, why are you asking about this? I'm fascinated. Uh, okay. So, so you, uh, when, when we last uh, were together on this program, we were talking about uh, this issue of free speech, particularly in Europe, with regard to uh, transgender rights, quote unquote. We were. Um, what, it, is anybody making the case that transgender is just a fiction and, and that it's silly? Does, is anybody still uh, making that case, or have we all rolled over? The main people who've actually been opposing it uh, and who've been in, in a rather strong position to do so have been the more old-fashioned feminists, such as Jermaine Greer, uh, who've got into, and, and a very interesting person called Julie Bindle, who've got into quite a lot of trouble uh, have been threatened with the exclusion from university campuses for saying this, and they've been quite firm on saying that that, uh, that a woman is a woman, and you can't create a woman by surgery, for instance, which has got uh, caused a, a, quite a lot of bitterness between these two different factions of the left. Conservatives tend to be a bit wary of it, and partly because of the, 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 as far as certainly this affects me. I, I've no doubt that there are some very unhappy and troubled people who believe that they are, they are they're in the wrong body. I, I've talked to people who say this, and I don't doubt their, their discomfort. I always I, feel I, that I, I've... But I, I don't, I, 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 therefore I don't, whenever I want to get involved in this, I feel very restrained by a desire not to hurt anybody personally. Yeah. 
Well, I, I, I should say, I feel... Some things which Jermaine Greer has said might have been hurtful to, to such people. And I, yeah. I, but it, it, she's, it, well, because she's of the left, she's freer to say them. And in any case, it's her style. Hang on, we're going to go to a break. Folks, I'm talking to Peter Hitchens. This is the Eric Metaxas Show. Stick around. I'm talking to Peter Hitchens. And, of course, the first question I want to ask you, Peter, have you, Peter Hitchens, ever been hooked on a feeling? I I don't think so. (laughs) Okay. I might have been, but but didn't realize this at the time, I suppose. But I don't think so, no. I I sense you're a very private person, which makes me want to ask you very personal, uncomfortable questions. Well, that's okay. How long have you been married? I don't really get particularly personal answers. How how long have, have you been married, and how many children do you have? I've been married since 1983, and I have three children. Since 1983. I've spent some time with one of your sons, a delightful young man. I'm glad you thought so. Yeah. I, I can't remember his first name, but uh, it, it, it's it's embarrassing. But we were when I was uh, in Oxford uh, the last time, um, I got to know him a little bit, hanging around with Michael Ward. People who listen to this program know that I did a number of uh, Socrates in the City events in Uh, Oxford, you were my guest for one of those, Michael Ward, uh, who who wrote the book Planet Narnia, was one guest. And, of course, I had spent a lot of time with Walter Hooper, who was C.S. Lewis's secretary in the last year of his life, and and, a wonderful time. And we all went to the Trout. Uh, and your your son was there. What are you, what are your son's names? Just so I can remember which one this his, is. His, his, the name that he uses is Daniel or Dan. What do you mean the name that he uses? Well, he has other names, which you know, like all of us, he, he doesn't necessarily no, employ no, at the moment. But he might no, change his mind. No, I, I don't. Co- I, I don't know cousin, what you mean, Peter. What do you a mean? Who was who, who was who was called um, by his parents Jeremy, but he hated it so much that he insisted on being called Richard. And uh, <laughs> Who can blame him in a way? But I, but I, I think you no. Know, I, I, people don't always use the name that they're, that, that they're given at uh, baptism. Okay, so your son Daniel uh, does not. He does not go by the name that you and your wife yeah, gave he him. Does, but he's got another one as well. <laughs> I'm just saying. He said. What, what? Wait a minute. Uh, let's not go. Let's not Just, go just a moment. Excuse so me, he, sir. He uses one of the two names that he was given at baptism. All right. You mean that his middle name is Daniel? No. Does he have a middle name? No, I don't mean that at all. You, you, you don't, you don't even mean by. that a you little just, bit. You asked which of his names did he go by, and I told you. By which of his now, names? You're now making a by which, out of this. Please don't, please, please don't end a sentence in a preposition. By which of these names did he go? Not by which of these names did he go by. Uh, not which of these yeah, names did he go by. That would have been redundancy, but it, I know. You, you could have used it. All right. You, you know, it's so interesting because people, uh, those people who know that your b- brother is the late Christopher Hitchens realize that the, the two of you are are very much alike in your precision with language. Um, and it's a, it's a delight for that reason alone uh, to, to speak with you. There are, there are other delights, although I don't want to think of them as delights. It makes me uncomfortable. But, but the point is that we were talking about free speech and transgender, and I well, think that it, you're living in a culture, you know, most Americans uh, of any kind of conservative or Christian stripe realize that you, Europe uh, is farther along in, in, uh, in the process of, of Decay, if this is the process on which we've all embarked, and that you all are farther along uh, in terms of of uh, how far you've gone with secularism and how much you've abandoned the Christian roots of the UK, and of course, the idea of transgender, it's it's part of that. It's this idea of rejecting some kind of order and seeming to think the way the uh, the, the French did two hundred and something years ago that we can reinvent everything. We can make our weeks ten days. Uh, we can we can do what we like. It seems to me that the transgender movement partakes of that kind of utopianist so, so, social uh, engineering uh, thinking. 
Yeah, well, I think you know, I think that's that's more or less the case. That's it. Yes, you think it's the case. Mm-hmm. You don't have anything else to say. Well, I could. But I don't. I, I don't want to shock seems you. To me, to be to be a sort of given, really. That oh yes, it's a given. But maybe my audience doesn't see it so, as a given. The, the, you know, the, the, the Christian religion, as an, uh, an organized, believed phenomenon, survives still in the United States in ways which it doesn't do in, uh, I think, any part of Europe. So, do you have any theories on why that is? Oh, the First World War. You didn't really have it, and we did. We well, you know we did. You and I discussed this uh, once, and you discussed it at Socrates and City a number of years ago. And I have to say, it was from you that I learned. What it was that World War One did to Europe culturally and how it uh, eroded the authority of the church and the state. I had never known that because I'm yeah. an American, as you say. So say a little bit about that, because that's quite important. All right. Well, here's the uh, Paul Cambon, who was the French ambassador to London uh, it, before and during the First World War and afterwards, said that England after the First World War was like a country that had undergone a revolution. And I, I think that he was right. France had undergone a, a different revolution, but it, because it, it had been fighting a, a war of national survival, which Britain had not been. But the real problem was that the, the First World War, which was actually a, a pretty squalid uh, dispute between a, an alliance of Russia and France and an alliance of Germany and Austria, in which both sides opportunistic, opportunistically seized an event to create a war which they thought they would gain from, was presented to the people, particularly of Britain, but also, I think, of the other countries involved. I I know more about what happened in Britain, as a sort of crusade against evil. Uh, We were told that the wicked Germans had had, had cruelly invaded Belgium. We were told atrocity stories, some of which were true, but most of which were not, about their invasion. And we were persuaded that it was necessary morally for us to fight for what was... Okay, we're going to go to another break. Forgive me, uh, but I I do want to continue... Yeah, well, I'll still be here when you come back. Very good. Folks, stick around. Metaxastalk.com is the website. If you go there real quick and get a pack of smokes, check it out. Down, down, and the flames went higher. And it burns, 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 the ring of fire. Hey, folks, this is Eric Metaxas Show. I'm talking to Peter Hitchens, who is currently in Oxford, England. Uh, I trust most of you who are listening are not. Peter, you were just explaining to us, and this is very important because I I think that many people listening right now didn't hear it when we spoke about it earlier or didn't catch your um, the first conversation we had at Socrates in the City. You you, you explain how World War I was dramatically influential in Europe and in England uh, in eroding the trust that your average Britain had with— with the church and with the state, and you you say that somehow uh, people were persuaded, or at least the powers that be, tried to persuade the average Englishman that he needed to go to war, that there was a moral reason to fight the Hun, to fight uh, Germany. It's something that has always puzzled me. Uh, do you? What, what is your sense? I mean, when we're talking about the Nazis, you see, I can see the uh, moral duty uh, to, to stand against the Nazis. But when I think of Germany, uh, you know, in 1914, it's hard for me uh, to think of the Germans, uh, in, in the same way as the way I would think of them in the, in the, in World uh, War II. What was going on? In, in my mind, and I think I, I, I commend particularly to anybody who wants to know about the outbreak of this, the most brilliant book ever written on it by Barbara Tuchman, that's T-U-C-H-M-A-N, uh, called The Guns, the Guns of August. It is so good that I, that I can't begin to tell you how good it is. But there's no question, it seems to me, and there's been work done, I think, by, by Fritz Fischer in Germany as well, uh, the, the Germans started the war. Uh, they took advantage of the crisis in the Balkans to start the war to invade Belgium, uh, which they had no uh, no conceivable excuse for doing as, as, as an attack on France. Uh, there's also no doubt whatsoever that France had been had been engaging in plans with Russia for what could be described as an encirclement of Germany, and France had been spending huge amounts of money on arming Russia and up 
upgrading its railroads and all kinds of other things to make it more fit for a war with Germany. And, the, the and why? Why? Well, because, because France uh, had, was, apart from anything else, uh, France had been humiliated in the 1870 uh, Franco-Prussian War and wanted to get back its lost territory and prestige and saw Russia as the best ally for this because Russia's interests were, of course, not um, were, were opposed to those of Germany, particularly in Ukraine and Poland and most of Central Europe, which are actually the, the, the major battlegrounds of all European wars of the past century. So it was cynical calculation. Uh, that they felt that they needed an ally, and that was where they were going to turn. And then they decided that they needed Britain as well, and, that, and a lot of secret diplomacy took place in which Britain was secretly inveigled into an alliance with France, which was never formally agreed, but which actually, uh, not, and the, which the British cabinet didn't know about, and Parliament certainly didn't know about, but under which the moment the, the war began, uh, Britain entered it, uh, with, uh, and excuses were then invented afterwards. And this is part of the reason for the the, the fiction that it was a great war for civilization. Uh, the British people were not subject to conscription at the time. There was no military conscription. We had a very small army, and suddenly we were faced with a continental war in which a large army was necessary. Well, to get huge numbers of young men to enlist, uh, you had to invent a moral cause. So the rape of Belgium was one, and, and a, 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 an obligation to Belgium which didn't really exist was uh, was invented, and an awful lot of, of propaganda about atrocities, some of which was true, as I say, was uh, was spread. Uh, but as you rightly say, it certainly didn't remotely resemble it as, as a great war for civilization. And I have a, in my possession a medal given to my great uncle, who served in the Royal Navy in the First World War, uh, on which the words Great War for Civilization, the Great War for Civilization, are engraved, because that's what all those who served in it w were given. And that's what the war was referred to as by the, by the British government at the end of it, the Great War for Civilization. In fact, it, it, it resulted in the destruction of European civilization in many ways, because the, the promises made and the, the ideals fanned into, in, 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 into flame by it, uh, were all based on a false premise. And most of those who survived it and came back were, were embittered by the experience. It's, it's always, uh, I guess the word is discomforting, to realize that um, the way things once were, I would normally, I would normally think of them uh, as better than the way things are now, that the way things once were had... A particular downside that if that that you have to begin to see how people were turned off uh, to the powers that be of their day because the powers that be did in fact abuse their authority. This is a this is a classic well, uh, yes, case in point because they had so much authority. The moral authority of the church and of the government, and count to that even of newspapers and politicians, in 1914, between 1914 and 1916, really, when conscription was eventually introduced, was enormous. And, it, and also the, the, the way in which society was much, much more self-restrained. Uh, have you read uh, The World of Yesterday by Stefan Zweig? Uh, I've, no, I've read no Zweig to my well, shame. It's, it's, it's an extraordinary book because a lot of it describes the Vienna of before 1914. And he found it stifling and he describes it as such. But I think there's also a certain amount of regret for its loss. It was a, it was, it was a time when people were much more shocked. They were more shocked by bad language. They were more shocked by violence. They were more shocked by shouting and screaming. They were generally so much more restrained than, than, than we were. that the, the disturbance which then came into their lives after 1914 destroyed not just a society and an economy, but it, it destroyed an entire moral system. And this is this is very well described by what what was and what and what no longer was, and, and because people really did revere monarchs, they really did believe what their priests told them. They well, really did think that if they were urged into the into battle for the sake of goodness and justice, that that was what they were going to fight for. And so when they discovered that this wasn't so, uh, they were, they were profoundly changed as people, and they they came back as as, as completely different people. Well, One we, of the great casualties of that had to be uh, the Christian faith. Both well, but both I, but Catholic I, I and Protestant in America, I think we would trace this back to the '60s, but that seems laughable. You did go, yeah, exactly. It was it was it was. It, 
your your closest approach to it, I think, was was Vietnam. We've been watching here the Ken Burns series on the Vietnam yeah. War, which I thought excellent. Though we've seen a, a rather truncated version of it, and obviously it's, it, it reminds me. I was my young manhood, the background noise of my young man, yeah. the Vietnam War, and it was it hugely dominated a lot of my my thought and understanding. But obviously, H- hang on, we, more, we've got to listen to for you. We, we're going to go to another break here. Yeah, I, I, we're going to have a final segment uh, with Chris Hitchens. Uh, sorry, with Peter Hitchens, the brother of Chris Hitchens. There you go. Things. Folks, we'll be right back. Stick around. Taxes show just a few minutes uh, left uh, with with Peter Hitchens, uh, who is in Oxford at his home in Oxford. Are you at your home in Oxford? I am. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I we were just talking about how in the United States it seems that the loss of authority, institutional authority, some of the things that that held the culture together, uh, that really went away mostly in the '60s, but. Uh, for you, uh, in England, uh, it, it went away as a result of World War One. This is a big thing for Americans to understand. And as I said, I didn't understand it until you brought it to my attention just a few years ago. Uh, it, it's in some ways it's confusing because I don't see the evidence of it in my reading of, let's say, the 20s and the 30s and the, the, the lead up to World War Two. I would think that it happened after World War Two. But uh, so, what's some of the evidence that we have in the twenties and the thirties that this took place? Evidence that we have, well, I suppose, apart from anything else, a huge decline in church attendance. Well, things like that, yeah, yeah. yeah. But culturally, uh, cultural evidence. Well, I think that again, one can see in the in, in, in the, the, the music and and drama and literature of the nineteen twenties and the nineteen thirties a, a, a turning away from the from from the more restrained uh, forms of of before nineteen fourteen. And in, in general, also, of course, hugely in the, the nature of the, the, the family and in the role of women. Another, another of the things which the war did uh, was it created uh, the idea that it was normal for women to go out of the home to work. I didn't realize that that came that, that early. Who wrote the poem uh, that's mocking the phrase dulce et decorum est? Wilfred Owen. The famous Wilfred Owen. But there was a lot of... It's kind of funny because it really does seem like the 70s in America hit, um, you're right, 50 years earlier uh, in England with, with, with poems like that, that that mocked the monarchy and all of these, what well, they so would have... The monarchy, it wasn't, that, that wasn't really a, a particularly an issue. And the monarchy has, has been in the background of, of British politics probably for the past century. Well, I, no, it's, not, it's not been a strong political issue, but the, the mockery of patriotism of a particular right. kind of patriotism. Right. Uh, there was a series of books which have, which have um, very strongly urged on us and widely read. When I was at school, uh, Robert Graves' Goodbye to All That and yeah. Steve Sassoon's Memoirs of Fox Hunting Man were two. Uh, there, were, there were others. There were many, many plays, uh, Journey's End by R.C. Sheriff being one of them, which, again, made it plain that the experience of the trenches had been, had been horrendous. And m- many people found it very, very hard uh, looking back on it yeah. to justify what... And, and the person who'd been brought up uh, in the late 19th century or the early 20th century, gently brought up uh, in, a, in, a, in a very rather sweet and restrained era, to be shoved into this place where he was surrounded by rotting corpses being eaten by rats. Uh, it was very difficult for him to believe in Dolce et Decorum Est Pro Patria Mori. Uh, and, and, and many people ceased to believe in it because yeah. they, so they saw that it was by no means sweet or decorous to die in this way. On the contrary, they, they fought over, over the rotting corpses of, the, of their comrades. Uh, on that. Another very fine book I can recommend here, by the way. It's called Covenant with Death by Michael John Harris, which describes the 
shattering effect on, on many of the, of the young men who volunteered for war in 1914 and eventually marched into the German machine guns at the Battle of the Somme in July 1916. We, we're, we're at another hard break. Peter, well, maybe you can I, stick... I, so that recommendation sticks. Maybe you can stick around... Uh, uh, Folks, that's this hour. So sorry uh, to end it now.